Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I had a pretty busy weekend, so I didn't really have anything prepared for this coming week. But I did have something that I've been meaning to do for a while, and that is have a look at a new channel called FE Peer Review. This is a very small channel, less than 100 subscribers, but he wants to approach the Flat Earth from a scientific basis as a peer review agency. So I thought I'd support him a little bit and go over one of his recent videos. Now, this was released on the 27th of July, which is today, and he wanted to ask some questions of the debunking community. Now, he had talked to me about this in advance, so this wasn't unexpected, but I thought I'd go over his questions real quick, and I thought I'd bring you guys along for the ride. So let's cue up the music and get going. This is FE Peer Review, the Flat Earth Peer Review channel. The date is July 27th, 2020. This is not a peer review of another video. These are questions I would like to put to the so-called Globe Earth community. And I would really welcome feedback, your thoughts on these various questions and issues. I'll number them for easier reference in case you wish to address a specific question. One, when we confront a specific Flat Earthers video, do we risk raising the prominence of that person and the subject of Flat Earth by increasing their YouTube ranking? Is this a necessary evil and we simply must address their claims? Is there typo? Is there a typo? Fix that. Is there another way, effective way to address their claims without that drawback? Well, you know, I think this is a great question. Are we bringing attention to the Flat Earth and, and specific Flat Earth YouTube creators by highlighting their interesting theories in our debunking videos. I think that there's a lot to be said for that because it seems the more stupid the video that is put out by the Flat Earth, if one of us actually does a debunking of it, it gives it some sort of legitimacy. If you have a debate between the Flat Earth and the globe, the Flat Earth gains more from that than the globe does because they get to debate a prominent globe earther and the globe earther is basically wrestling in the mud with the pigs and it doesn't do much for their resume. So here's the way I've approached it. The way I look at it is unless I'm looking at a specific flat earther that I want to hold up to scrutiny, I do not mention the name of the flat earth channel that I'm debunking. And there's a reason for that. These are simply not original arguments from that flat earther. Flat earthers in general repeat the exact same 10 or so arguments that have been going around the Flat Earth community since 2005. There is no original thought in the Flat Earth community. Am I going to credit Phuket Word with coming up with the phrase, water finds its level? How about the horizon rises to eye level? Is that from Nathan Oakley or Quantum Eraser? No. These have been floating around the community. They're simply repeating them. So I don't really feel that there is a need to draw attention to a specific Flat Earth channel or put a link in unless they are putting out a new idea. And quite frankly, not seeing many of those, Chief. Two, Google shows the search term Flat Earth continuing to drop. Do we work against that trend when we do debunk videos? Should we be stopping or cutting back with the debunk videos, or do we try to bury it under an avalanche of facts? The graph shows the last five years. You know, actually, this is a great point as well. Do we address the flat earth as a legitimate scientific topic of conversation? I really don't think that we need to. I think that what we do need to do is use the flat earth to give us examples of bad science. And then what we do is we address the bad science, not the flat earth. So for example, when they talk about the atmosphere next to the vacuum of space being a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, we don't address that video and counter the fact that it is not a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. What we do is we explain what the second law of thermodynamics actually is. And then as an extension of that, how the atmosphere and space can actually merge together at the top of our atmosphere. So this is a science lesson 
from a question raised by a cult. So we address the science question. We don't address the silliness. Let's go on to the next one. Three, how dangerous are the proponents of flat earth? What harm do they do? Is the flat earth a danger? Well, no. They're not in danger of changing basic science. They're not in danger of changing the spherical shape of the earth or discounting gravity. What they are is a small and relatively insignificant group that does nothing but sow dissent and distrust of science and education. The problem that you run into with the flat earth is the anti-science bias. The idea that you accept the idea of a conspiracy theory over facts without checking them yourself or understanding the facts that you do check. This anti-science bias does represent a threat. It represents a threat to the critical thinking skills that are essential for society. It promotes conspiracy theories, not only in the flat earth, but in other areas. For example, you could say moon landing deniers are relatively harmless as well. Disrespectful to the great sacrifices made by countless people to get us to the moon. Disrespectful of the science the moon landings have provided us. But truthfully, whether you believe we landed on the moon or not is inconsequential. We did. You can have silly beliefs if you wish. The problem that you run into is when you extend this to things that actually do matter. For example, the anti-vax movement. You can go out and claim that vaccines cause autism and there are significant amounts of aluminum and mercury in vaccines. We can point out the basis of these assertions and how they were disproven with science. You'll continue to believe what you want. You won't get your children vaccinated. And as a result, we get measles, mumps, pertussis, and hepatitis A epidemics in the 21st century at a time that we shouldn't be having vaccine preventable diseases. That is a direct extension of the conspiratorial and anti-science attitude promoted by the flat earth. And as thinking educated people, we have an obligation to oppose that dumbing down of America and the world. So let's go on to the next one. Four. If they are dangerous and we've decided it is necessary to go after them, is it better to focus on the handful with the largest channels and audience, or is it better to go after the many smaller channels with smaller audiences to keep them from growing? Well, unfortunately, I think you've already answered this question, or at least you've heard my answer to this question. Number one, are they dangerous? Not really. Just the anti-science and conspiratorial thinking that they promote is dangerous. And in the flat earth specifically, that really isn't a danger because they're not of enough consequence to have an impact on the world. They do, however, by promoting these conspiratorial theories, promote other conspiratorial theories and give them some legitimacy, such as the anti-vax movement. So do we focus on the larger channels or the smaller channels? Well, first, if we focus on the smaller channels, we bring attention to them. That's attention that would get them potentially some adherence in the conspiratorial mindset. Why tell these people new channels to go look at? Let them go ahead and do the work and find them themselves. As far as the larger channels, as I said earlier, I don't really credit a lot of the flat earth channels with my debunks. I debunk the science that they bring up because they're the same tired, previously debunked arguments that we've been dealing with since 2005. They simply aren't special or original. Now, if they come up with something original, I might actually give them a credit. But if they're repeating the same nonsense again and again that 27,000 other flat earthers have been repeating for the last 10 years, why do they get credit for it? I'd rather concentrate on debunking the erroneous thinking and the bad science than debunking the flat earther. So that's my answer to that. Five, many of the prominent flat earthers embrace all kinds of conspiracies. Is it more effective to go after their conspiracy mindset in a broad way by confronting their psychological issues, in a sense to go after the root of the problem, 
or is it better to use a science debunk approach to go after each little diluted claim they make? Death by a thousand cuts. Yes, I know we can do both, but is one preferable or more effective? You know, that's an interesting thing that I've been thinking about for the last six months or so. I do go after the claims on their own, not related to flat earth, simply the bad science. But lately, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been trying to point out some of the techniques that the flat earthers use to build their channel and sell t-shirts. So for example, the NLP techniques that Phuket Word uses, the incorrect use of logical fallacies over on the Flat Earth Debate Show with Oakley and uh, questionable education, and the techniques that they use to try and disrupt the argument that is being brought against them, the way that they try and dodge having any sort of claim that is subject to testing and verification. They'd rather simply put the ball in the court of the globe earth and then make somebody defend the globe. And if they can't successfully do it or they get overwhelmed by their badgering panel, somehow by defeating the globe, that makes Flat Earth the next logical choice. You know, make them make positive claims. And this is something that I've been stressing lately. Analyze their strategy and their line of attack. You don't fight their fight. You make them fight your fight. And that's the way you do it. The other thing that you can do is the Yoda loop. Always try and take them off script. They have a very specific script that they use. So start off your debate by saying, you know, you're right. I've come to doubt that the Earth is a sphere anyhow. Why don't you tell me what your evidence for another shape would be? What shape do you think it is, Nathan? And that takes away their entire argument and they don't know what to do with it. So by analyzing their attack this way, not only is it an interesting exercise in logic, it's an interesting exercise in debate. And it's fun to watch them flounder when you take them off a script. So let's look at the final question. Six. Is it more effective to go after them by trying to make them look foolish in front of their followers by calling them stupid, flirper, etc.? Does that strengthen or weaken the resolve of their followers? Or is it more effective to keep a calm emotional level and stick to science and objectivity, a just the facts, ma'am, approach? You know, this is the final question. I think it's one of the best. Uh, you always get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. I think that calling people stupid that believe in the flat earth right off the bat is probably not going to help bring people to your side and your point of view. I think that eventually, when you talk to a lot of these people in the Flat Earth community, and people listen to you talking to them and trying to give them some basic respect, those people will come to the conclusion that the Flat Earthers are stupid. You don't necessarily have to guide them to that conclusion. They'll get to it all by themselves. Now, there are some people that are willfully ignorant in the Flat Earth. And these are people that, quite frankly, I don't really have much respect for, and I show that. But if you have somebody that is truly new to the Flat Earth and actually wants to have a discussion, have a meaningful discussion with them and see if you can gently guide them to some correct thought and correct understanding of the process. You know, for example, with Nathan Oakley, it's very clear he does not understand what the second law of thermodynamics is. But if you approach him differently saying, hey, it's obvious you've looked into the second law of thermodynamics and I actually had to go look into it to make sure that I could discuss it with you properly. Now, I think you've got a lot of it down pretty well, but there's a couple of small mistakes that you're making. And let me kind of point those out. And maybe we can work through that and understand what's going on with the atmosphere. So for example, if you have an atmosphere under pressure, Next to the vacuum of space, the atmosphere will clearly expand out to fill the void. However, if there is a force doing work on that atmosphere, such as gravity, that is why we have the pressure gradient, which we can see and measure. And that's why as the pressure gradient decreases down to the vacuum of space, there's a gradual decrease under the influence of this gravity. And that's what holds the spherical atmosphere 
around the spherical Earth. Now, while you'll never convince Nathan that he's wrong, by taking that approach, you get your true audience, and that is the people listening to this discussion, and you get them thinking, and then they start understanding this better. Nathan will never change his mind because he makes money selling t-shirts and getting donations to his channel. This is his little stick. This is his act, his script. But the people that are actually tuning in and trying to listen to this and learn something will learn something from your approach. So I think that you need to have as much of a non-confrontational approach as you can. You always be the adult in the conversation doesn't matter how much they try and bait you and how childish people like Quantum Eraser will be and the names that they'll call you, etc. You be the adult. The audience, which are the people that you are actually trying to reach, will pick up on that and they will realize he's being childish and you're the adult in the room and they'll give more weight to what you say than the silliness that the children say. So that's the way to approach it. Now, I think that these were great questions and they're ones that we should all be thinking about in the debunking community. Should we be highlighting the flat earth community? No, it's not really that important. Should we be approaching the science that's being misrepresented? Most definitely. Should we approach critical thinking and anti-conspiratorial thinking? You betcha. People that are tuning into this and exploring it will start listening to us rather than the Jerry Springers. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. Just a short little video. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. Now I've got a nice store going right now. We've got some really cool masks since we all have to wear masks now when we're out in public. Got some cool t-shirts and other things as well if you'd like. We have memberships to the channel and a Patreon. So I'm going to go on out and have a look with a telescope tonight and see a few things and kind of Get ready for some videos that I'm doing on that in the near future. So in the meantime, take care, and we'll see you again soon.